I'm delighted to have the opportunity to talk to you today. I want to discuss some of the items in our collection, but I'd like to do so in what is perhaps an unusual way. Instead of just showing you a map and talking about it as a map, I'm going to show you maps as a way of telling a particular story. I want to put these fascinating documents into a wider historical context to give you an insight into what makes them so fascinating. But there's another strand to this. Maps don't exist in isolation. They are part of a wider body of historical documents of different kinds, which can come together to give a much more complete picture than they can on their own. It's very easy for a specialist like me to see only my particular area of interest. But today, I want to go beyond that. And so I'll be illustrating the stories told by the maps with text and images from elsewhere in the library's extensive collections. By the end, I hope that you'll have a new insight into the breadth of those collections and how they can work together to illuminate the past. I suppose every story has to start somewhere. And where better than at the beginning? This is the oldest map in the, our collection, a map of the British Isles published in 1486 in Ulm, Germany. The colouring is almost as vivid as when it was new. This map is taken from a volume called Geographia, which was originally written in the second century AD by a Roman geographer called Claudius Ptolemaeus, often known simply as Ptolemy. Ptolemy's work was lost after the fall of the Roman Empire, but rediscovered at the end of the 13th century in the Byzantine Empire, from where it arrived in the West in the 14th century. It was translated into Latin at the beginning of the 15th century and published later in the century using the new technology of the printing press. <coughs> the Geographia contains instructions on how to create a world map using a map projection created by Ptolemy. It's important to say that, despite what you may have heard, people in antiquity didn't think the world was flat. By the time of Ptolemy, they'd known it was round for hundreds of years and had actually come up with a relatively accurate figure for its circumference. The volume also contains coordinates for various towns and geographical <laughs> features. It is probable that this information was used to produce maps for the original book, but none survived antiquity. However, when the work was rediscovered, the coordinates and map projections were used to create new maps, which were printed using the woodblock method. Woodblock printing like this does not allow for the same fine detail as engraving on copper plates. But it was some years before the likes of Mercator started producing their own modern maps using this method. At the end of the 15th century, this was the latest thing. This, of course, poses a problem because the information contained in this map was over 1,200 years old by the time it was printed. It shows the world of the second century, not the 15th century. As to the content of the map itself, you can see that Scotland has been twisted at right angles and that England and Wales are badly distorted. There is little information for Wales, a couple of settlements and a few rivers. It's not very helpful. Of course, we tend to forget that in between the 2nd and the 15th centuries, people were still making and using maps. There are a few examples of these that have survived, such as the Hereford Map of Mundi and the Goth Map. We also know of other maps which are now lost, such as Geraldus Cambrensis's Map of Wales from 1205. We know a lot about the map because the author describes it in detail in a letter. It was known to be in Westminster Abbey Library in the 17th century, it was seen by Thomas Tanner, Bishop of St. Asaph, sometime before 1695, but is presumed lost in a fire at the Abbey in that year. What we do know of it is tantalizing. The letter states that his Cambrai Totius Mapam contained steep mountains and frightening forests, ponds and rivers, and the architectural features of castles, cathedrals, and a multitude of churches and monasteries, mostly of the Cistercian order and any number of walled enclosures and other highly ornamented constructions. This on a folio page with a northern orientation and the smaller places are concisely but densely inserted with a much reduced space. Nonetheless, are both rendered distinctly and labeled in a legible fashion. But as this slide indicates, we know nothing more of it 
save for a few references in other works in the 17th century. Richard Goff, the antiquary, after whom the Goff nap is named, searched for it in vain in 1780. Having mentioned the Goff map, I couldn't resist showing you a picture of it, uh, courtesy of the Bodleian Library, where obviously the original is located. Um, it's undergoing a great deal of detailed scrutiny at the moment using the latest scientific methods. The Goff map dates to about 1360 and is one of a few surviving maps in the medieval period. Its significance lies in the amount of detail that is to be found on it. Although we don't have the original here at the National Library, we do possess several facsimiles, including one made by Richard Goff in 1780 and one made by the Ordnance Survey, which has the place names transcribed. Here is a close-up of the section of the Ordnance Survey facsimile showing Wales. You can see the Snowdon Massif and uh, Plinlimon. What is not apparent from this uncoloured facsimile is that Plinlimon is shown as a lake. On the original, it's coloured the same as the sea. Nobody seems to be entirely sure why, but it's most likely a copyist Sarah, providing evidence for the theory that this map is actually copied from an earlier one. Another interesting feature is that this map uses the name Aberystwyth. This has been used recently as an argument for a later date for the map of around 1400. The argument goes that the name Aberystwyth was not used before this date. Indeed, many official documents of this time refer to the location as Llanbadan Vaur. However, there are references to the name Aberystwyth at least as far back as 1232. Now I want to move the story along a bit to the 1500s and talk about the first printed map of Wales by Humphrey Lloyd. First published by Abraham Ortelius in the Netherlands in 1573, this map is a synthesis of disparate historical sources, including old maps, used by Lloyd to create what is more of a historical miscellany than an accurate cartographic representation. Perhaps the most striking thing about this map is that it was still being reissued over 150 years after it was first published, despite the appearance of much more accurate and up-to-date maps of the country, which became available not long after its creation. I could discuss at length the nature of the map, its inaccuracies or its cultural and political message, but I want to look at a different aspect of the map, namely the circumstances of its creation. Excuse me. Humphrey Lloyd was one of those Renaissance polymaths who flourished in Elizabethan Britain. <coughs> Given the Tudor dynasty's roots, it's perhaps no surprise that many were Welsh, or of Welsh descent, such as George Owen of Henslis and John Dee, the mathematician. Lloyd served as MP for Denby for several years and helped the passage for the Act for the First Welsh Bible. He became acquainted with Abraham Ortelius through Richard Clough, a mutual friend. And with his interest in Welsh history, he soon, soon started corresponding with Ortelius on matters of Welsh history and geography, including a letter about the history of Anglesey, Demona Dridum Insula, sent to Ortelius in April 1568 and published in the Theatrum in 1570. Humphrey wrote again at the beginning of August of that year, enclosing two maps for Ortelius, a map of England and Wales, and the Cambrai Typus. This letter is held in the library's manuscript collection. In it, he mentions that he is ill, and in fact, he died later that same month. His maps and other works were published by Ortelius in the years <coughs> following his death. Humphrey knew that he was dying and sent the maps and accompanying notes to Ortelius as they were, and it appears that the material was not entirely complete at this time. With this letter are two others, written by the brothers Richard and Hugh Owen, who were entrusted with delivering the maps to Ortelius. 